It's now uh, 5.35, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll kind of introduce ourselves. My name is Ben, um, Ben Sugar. I'm the Senior Trail Builder with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. And with me is... Hi, you go, I'm Tracy. <laughs> I'm Tracy, um, and I'm a Field Trail Builder uh, with the Trail Conference. <laughs> Uh, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more about ourselves later, but what you were here for is trail layout and design. Um, I believe online the, the listing said it, it in one spot, it said two and a half hours. I am not going to be keeping you for two and a half hours uh, because, you know, we'll, we'll all want to eat dinner. Uh, so I, I believe I'm going to try to keep this to about an hour and a half, maybe a little longer if, if necessary. Um, but uh, yeah, that's going to include, um, you know, uh, plenty of time for answering questions and, and general discussion um, as needed. Um, and so in terms of participation there, if in your toolbar down, I believe, usually in the, the bottom of your screen, um, if you click on where it says participants, it should raise up all the participants and you can raise your hand if you have a question, maybe in the middle of uh, my talking, if I get on a roll, um, or you can also go into the group chat and send a question either just to Tracy and I or, or to everyone. Um, and then kind of during breaks, I'll pause and check that group chat and answer questions that have come in if you don't want to get on camera and, and talk that way. Um, so, uh, that is usually the best way to manage uh, this many people in one webinar. Um, so if you all could, in that chat box, um, type your name into the chat box, just, and that'll count as your attendance for this, especially uh, for volunteer hours, since this is kind of a continuing like skills workshop for those of you who are uh, existing volunteers, work on volunteer committees or our maintainers or the like. Um, and that way we'll have a roll call of, of how many people attended. Um, and if you are having trouble with any of these things, um, worst case scenario, just unmute yourself and, and speak up and, uh, and we'll deal with it that way. There's not that many of us, so. Uh, so, in addition, um, Tracy, it looks like I can launch the polls, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Oh, uh, so, just a poll, just to kind of, without having everyone tell us their entire life story, um, in, in the interest of getting information, though, about um, how everyone is, just let us know kind of what your background is, because we have found that we get all, all kinds. Um, and... You know, if but if it's heavily skewed towards one direction or another, that helps us know how to present some of this info. All right, it looks like we've one of the message. All right, well, it looks like we've got a pretty skilled, experienced bunch here, which which makes sense because that's kind of who this was being marketed to. Um, and for for those of you who uh, this is brand new to you, it's uh, um, don't worry, it's, uh, it's not rocket science, and I, I'm more than willing to uh, <clears throat> slow down and, and re-explain anything that maybe uh, is a little confusing. All right. Okay. So, uh, 
just some housekeeping items before we get started. First off, I want to um, wish a, a, a thank you and express our gratitude to uh, Liberty Subaru, um, you know, whose donation is helping fund these, you know, digital outreach um, efforts. You know, with this year with COVID and everything, it's uh, it's very helpful. So just wanted to mention them really quickly. Um, additionally, these uh, webinars are all being stored on the cloud and are accessible on our website and the digital learning library. There is an old version of, of this uh, webinar on there. Some of you may have seen it, but um, hopefully you'll get something more out of it seeing it live. Uh, afterwards, um, I plan to send out a follow-up email with some reference materials um, for layout and design and trail specifications that some of you may find useful. Um, and normally this is a course that we do in the field or at least a portions of it in the field, tromping around and, and bushwhacking. Um, <clears throat> as you see in the, in the photo here, laying things out in the real world. Uh, and hopefully when uh, things, uh, things change, we'll be able to go out and actually do that. So I am planning to do some sort of field component to this to follow up on these webinars because there's only so much you can do with a PowerPoint. Uh, eventually need to get out there with some pin flags and, uh, and get your hands dirty. So, so the topics we're going to cover um, are where sustainable trail design and the process of, of laying out a trail alignment, where they fit within a trail's life cycle uh, from, from concept to completion and maintenance. Um, and then within that, we'll talk about uh, trail planning and how control points work. We'll get into what those are, um, what the different uh, tenets of sustainable trail design are and, and how they inform how layout should be conducted uh, and how much of that is dictated by managing water. Um, we'll go through the layout process in at least uh, in terms of uh, abstract concepts, but also down into some of the nitty gritty decision making that you, you would do in the field to lay out a trail. And then at the end, just to do the follow through, we'll talk about um, some basic trail construction uh, concepts and process for building new trail at the very least. Um, one thing uh, is worth mentioning is, is these, uh, these areas of, of knowledge are also helpful for trail assessment of existing trails, which I think is more relevant for a lot of the people here. Um, being able to look at a section of, of trail that's maybe eroding or having water issues or what have you and uh, being able to diagnose what's wrong by speculating on which of these principles and methods are potentially being uh, violated or, you know, maybe uh, aren't quite up to snuff. So. Um, I assume everyone here is pretty familiar with the trail conference, so I'm going to zoom right past this. Um, if you want more information on what the trail conference is and basically what we do, uh, please you know, follow with me after the fact and we can, we can talk about all these numbers. But for the most part, I'm going to assume that everyone here is fairly familiar. Uh, here's our mission statement and the only thing to, to point out is you know, we strive to ensure that the trails and natural areas we share are sustainable and accessible for all to enjoy for generations to come. And so this is in many ways about that, one of the many ways we try to apply that mission um, to what we do. Uh, so I toyed with the idea of being disingenuous and providing a picture of me from when I still had hair, but then I thought better of it. Um, as for me, I've been involved in trail work in one way, shape, or form since 2003. Uh, I'm from Virginia originally, but I got my start building trail in New Hampshire and then uh, working for the Green Mountain Club in Vermont, leading uh, crews there, and have subsequently uh, coordinated volunteer uh, trail programs in Maryland outside of the DC area, and then with the uh, Forest Service out in Utah for a couple of years as well as uh, uh, graduate studies in recreation resource management in Utah, uh, Utah State. And I've been with the Trail Conference since 2018. Uh, 
Tracy, can you give your quick bio? Sure. Um, so I'm uh, fairly new to the trail conference staff. I uh, just joined this past January. Um, got my start with trail building um, actually with the Trail Conference Conservation Corps. Uh, I did that for two seasons uh, working on Bear Mountain um, and then did some various work with uh, PIPSI and um, with a private trail building company up in Maine before coming back down here to join the trail conference. Um, and I've spent most of the season up in the Hudson Highlands region working with our Conservation Corps up there. And that's that's what both of us are, are largely involved with in uh, planning and overseeing the projects that our Conservation Corps uh, carries out, but that's not the sum total of what we do, and we're, we're meant to be uh, additionally kind of a, a technical skills repository for, for those that, that you know, uh, want or need uh, consultation or assistance in any way, um, and some people, you know, want our involvement more than others, uh, but we're here, we're a resource that can be uh, that you can avail yourselves of um, uh, whenever you feel like it's warranted. But hopefully this will help you all uh, know some of the things that we know um, to whatever extent. So uh, the trail project process slash life cycle, um, going all the way through from when it is, when someone is staring at a map and has a good idea, um, the concept is, what if we, we made a route so that people could access this waterfall? Or, you know, it would be really great if these two trails are close to each other, but there's no connection. Maybe we should design a connection between them. Um, anything like that. Uh, the concept can, you know, it's broad. And then everything else that follows is turning that into reality. Um, we'll go through the planning process in terms of looking at both on the map and in the field, how do you actually start to lay out a, uh, a trail alignment that will make that concept possible? And then we get into the, you know, actually laying that out on the ground using design principles that we're gonna talk about here. So design is more of a noun, uh, whereas layout is more of a verb, if that makes sense. Um, and oftentimes it's, uh, it can get confusing between layout and design. Layout is something you do. Uh, design is a thing that informs how you should lay out the trail. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, and then through some of the exciting bureaucratic circus of review and approval, then through the process of construction, and then you get around to maintenance monitoring assessment, which that sometimes can take you all the way back to planning. Uh, in some cases, or maybe it just takes you, you know, regular maintenance. Maybe sometimes you have to go back and change layout, you get into relocations. That's how the cookie crumbles. Um, so trail concept, I think, is, is pretty simple. So we'll talk about planning first. Um, so again, it's, it's how you start to implement that broad, abstract concept for what you want it to be into something that can be actually exist on the ground. Um, so it becomes a general route, usually in, in planning documents, you'll, you'll often see something as a, a dashed line on a map um, with an air, you know, with arrows going one place or another, because it hasn't really been vetted on the ground yet. Um, and the goal with this process is to identify what are called control points. Uh, control points are, are things that you want the trail to gravitate towards, to take people towards, or to avoid. Um, the positive control points can enhance visitor experiences. Uh, it's something that if, you know, it could be the destination for the trail. It's, that's like the biggest control point. If, you're, if you've got a big overlook you want people to go to, that's a, a big positive control point. Uh, negative control points are things that are either sensitive resources or they are uh, things that are gonna take away from the user experience. And the biggest thing besides knowing what's on the ground is taking into consideration who are the users going to be? What type of folks are, are going to be coming, both in terms of user group and maybe sometimes demographics? And what kind of experience are they looking for? Do they want something rough and tumble, like a, a tough scramble? Um, are, are they looking for something a little bit more formal and easy to, you know, uh, 
easy to access? Um, do they want to climb very fast to get to something that they can see in you know 25 minutes like Breakneck Ridge? Or is this a long sort of, um, you know, a bike ride or horse ride that maybe it's the, uh, the journey is, a, is more interesting than the destination. So those things are helpful to think about. Uh, so here's a map of the Ramapo Valley uh, County Reservation area with all of the trails and other things stripped out. Uh, oops, nope, don't want that. Mm, there we go. All right. Uh, so let's place uh, spot the control points. Um, which features on this map do you all think could be uh, a negative control points? Give this a few more seconds. Hmm. All right, so uh, I think everyone seems to have gotten the obvious, uh, which is that a, a pipeline is a pretty negative uh, experience to cross. You, you could argue that, uh, you know, you get a, a change in, in uh, <clears throat> plant community, I suppose, but, but generally those things kind of take away from the experience, especially when there's exposed power lines or any sort of utility easement is usually a drag. Um, a couple of you chose the, the nickel mine. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of reasons for that. That is definitely, uh, potential negative control point because it could be hazardous. Um, depending on the state it's in, it could be an eyesore potentially. On the other hand, it also could be an interesting historical remnant. Um, so it, my, my point with that is, is that things can be both. They can be, it can have negative and positive aspects to them. And the context is what matters. Um, you know, and that's when you need to discuss with the land manager do you want people going near that, you know, old abandoned mine or not? Is that something we can interpret, um, lead people to, or do we want to keep people away from it? Um, in some sense, the Cactus Ledge is a great overlook, but it also has a, um, a community of prickly pear, uh, which is how it gets its name. And so it's, uh, it's a great thing to take people to because the view is the best in that area. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the front of that park, but it is a little bit rough on the local plant life uh, getting trampled. So has some aspects of both, and it really just is context dependent. All right. All right, so there's a lot you can see on a map. Uh, you can see where the nickel mine is, you can see where the reservoir is. Um, but you cannot see potentially where an interesting rock formation is or other items that are potentially smaller or more local control points that you can only really get a sense of when you're out there in the field, uh, bushwalking through a, a hillside, risking Lyme disease. Um, although I tend to like to do my, uh, my scouting in the fall and winter when the leaves are down so you can see more. Um, but the point is, is that a, getting out there on site and walking the area between uh, control points that you know about, you may find smaller additional control points that can either add to or detract from a user experience. Uh, you might find something that you know from experience would be maybe sensitive uh, snake habitat or something like that, that you wouldn't be able to tell from a map. 
and you'd want to steer away from that because you're going to get hammered during the review process by the parks biologist who's going to make you move it or you could find um you might find a trash dump or something like that um and connecting the dots on those control points and steering away from others uh will eventually be carried out during layout um and the process of doing that relies on an understanding of what sorts of layouts and, and trail alignments can be sustainably constructed and maintained so that's when we start to get into that so we're going to talk about what those design principles are so what is sustainable design and why is it important uh, the whole point is to minimize environmental impact minimize the amount of maintenance and construction costs that are going to be required and maximize the quality of the experience that users are able to get from use of that trail over a long long uh, period of time so you know these uh, legacy trails are you know 100 years old at this point in this area um, and so we try to build trails that will only require a certain amount of upkeep um, in, the, in the typical maintenance with clipping, water bark clearing, uh, reblazing, the typical maintenance activities, not having to go back every uh, 10, 15 years and reroute or renovate or install too many stairs. So again, uh, these layout principles come in in between the planning and layout process so that you can know what layout is going to work. So just to re-up this. Um, and sustainability is a buzzword. It gets thrown out there a lot, and it's, everyone knows it from an environmental perspective. But in terms of, um, say, maintenance costs and, uh, and also human involvement costs when it comes to getting volunteers to come out and actually work on something, there are social and economic dynamics to sustainability as well that are useful to keep in mind. Um, so these are our stock photographs for uh, for a degraded trail here on the left. Um, and one thing that doesn't always come to people's mind is expensive fixes. So, um, you know, I, I enjoy building rock steps, but it's certainly not the most cost effective uh, way to build trail because it is uh, resource intensive and takes a lot of time uh, to do it properly. Um, and but we, we only like to do that when it's absolutely necessary. And not everyone likes steps. So uh, you can get unhappy users if your trail is a mud hole or it's nothing but a giant staircase up the mountain. Um, so just uh, by way of illustration, proper trail design is relatively undamaged, but in many areas, trails on flat, areas or trails that go straight up the trail or up the hillside uh, on what you would call a fall line alignment will be muddy or eroded uh, and oftentimes widened out by people unsatisfied with the route that's been provided and how it's worn in over time. So um, some of the tenets of and best practices of sustainable trail design is again understand your trail users. How are they going to behave? Uh, anticipating how people will react in a given situation. Understand that people, uh, as much as you can train them on leave no trace principles, they're going to try to walk around mud. They're going to avoid um, climbing when they don't have to climb or going down a steep rock embankment uh, until the last possible moment. Um, we want to minimize what are called tread grades or the steepness of, of the trail alignment to a reasonable degree, and it's context dependent. Um, designed for drainage on a trail. So uh, drain often and, and drain well uh, for reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and to that end, build on, on what we call a drainable slope. Uh, avoid climbing straight up a slope where water can't escape. And you wind up with water that's just in a slightly u-shaped gully on your trail and it has no no way to escape uh, similarly avoid flat areas because on a flat area there's nowhere for the water to escape to um, understanding trail building techniques how are trails excavated 
on, uh, on a side slope. Um, how are stairs and water bars built? Uh, understanding those things can be helpful. So that's why we're going to cover that briefly at the end. And know in advance when you're laying out, uh, designing and laying out a trail, how is it going to be built? With whose money? Using what labor resources? And over what time frame? What tools do you have? Um, you know, can you get a truck full of stone dropped off? Or are you going to have to harvest from nearby? Uh, those things can affect what is realistic in terms of expecting your final trail product to look like. All right, so as, as I uh, mentioned earlier, so much of this is about managing water and uh, managing water and people. And the point is to get the water off the trail as quickly as possible and keep the users on. Before I get going, is, uh, let, me, let me check and see, does anyone have any questions so far? I hope nobody's fallen asleep yet. All right, then I will keep rolling. Um, so get the water off, keep the users on. Um, there's three primary forces that, are, uh, that we're dealing with is compaction from users' contact with the ground, uh, whether it's boots, tires, or hooves, um, displacement of soil material in different directions, and then the carrying away of that material via erosion, whether it's by wind or water. Uh, in our case, normally water. Uh, wind's only really a big deal on the west coast or in mountain summits. Um, so again, these three, compaction has a limit. Soil as a, if you consider it, think of it as a matrix of particles. There's sand, there's clay, there's gravel. Uh, but there are spaces in between that hold air and water, um, and it has a particular structure. When it's subjected to force from uh, vehicles especially, uh, but also, uh, you know, boots and hooves and, and tires, it gets compacted down, and it removes that space for air and, and water, and that's why a heavily trafficked lawn or a portion of uh, a forest, it gets trampled, and it's not just the physical trampling of vegetation that kills, uh, that kills it off. It's the fact that the soil is so compacted that they're having difficulty getting air, water, nutrients out of the soil, uh, which is why you aerate your, your lawn um, to reestablish that. Um, the benefit is a uh, compacted surface is durable. Um, it doesn't displace quite as easily, but it increases runoff. Um, displacement is what happens, you know, when you are walking along and, you know, your boots scuff the surface of the ground, or uh, when a horse hoof comes down on the ground, they have this scooping action. That's how they walk. They walk by scooping, so they're big on displacement. And that moves the soil particles around on the surface and breaks them up and makes them loose and that makes them uh, available to be carried away by erosion. Um, displacement is uh, theoretically limitless until you get down to bedrock and that's the thing we want to manage as much as possible. Uh, erosion is a natural process. Erosion has been happening since the formation of the earth, so, um, but we can manage erosion. Uh, the point of this is, is that erosion on trails, because of the, the added um, ingredient of human activity uh, via compaction and additional displacement, it exacerbates erosion and makes it more likely and more to be severe. Um, so again, this is the fall line. So the fall line is if you were to put a, 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 you know, a basketball on the top of a hill and just let it go, that direction, that path of least resistance from A to B, from the highest point to the lowest point, that's the fall line. Uh, the term fall line is used in ski run design the most because that's typically what ski runs are from the top to the bottom. Um, so if you're anywhere near parallel with the angle of the slope, that's what we call a fall line. And as you can see, once water gets into an area that's been a little bit eroded and compacted, 
in that that channel, it's very difficult to get it out. Uh, it takes a lot of excavation and fixes to try and make this work. And over time, it's going to become that big, wide U-shaped channel that you see so often in New England. Um, on trails, the erosion potential is, and, and erosion generally with water it is a function of how fast the water moves and how much of it there is, because that determines how much scouring power it has. Um, and additionally, uh, the more the water there is, the faster it's going and the greater scouring power it has, it's often carrying sediment that, all, that it kind of adds to that scouring power. Um, and each of these has components that some of them we can affect. Um, not necessarily worth uh, getting into every single one of these, but this will be in the, on the, uh, the PDF of this presentation that I'll, I'll make sure to link you all to, but we will talk about some of these. Um, so the first one there is the area drained for water volume. Um, and that gets into the idea of what's called a tread watershed. Uh, most of you um, at some point have come across the idea of, of what a watershed is. It's just the area of land that drains into a particular uh, water body. And you can think of a trail area or a length of trail as its own miniature watershed and analyze how much acreage or square footage upslope of that area is draining water down onto a given segment of trail. So if this were one long uninterrupted stretch of trail, this would all be one tread watershed because all that water is coming down and can then theoretically run down the trail. Our goal is usually to break this up into as many smaller areas as possible. So if any water runs on the trail, it doesn't have the chance to pick up as much speed or volume before it is diverted off by a drainage structure or a grade reversal, and then it can continue on its merry way down slope the way it wants to towards the ocean. Um, so based on that, we get into kind of the preferred design and layout solution, which is a rolling contour trail. Um, it involves uh, traversing slopes rather than climbing them directly and attacking them straight up and down. And it has horizontal and vertical flow, lots of meandering, uh, changes of, of direction in order to facilitate crests and dips that will allow for drainage. Okay, get a little surfer on there, uh, flying through. But, you know, this is easy to see on a hillside that's grassy like this uh, is a very pixelated image. The idea in oversimplifying, instead of climbing straight to the top of this slope, you would traverse around more gradually and gently. Um, and when we talk about grades, lower grades rather than going straight up a slope, um, allows you to keep the speed of water down. Um, so if wa water does travel along a stretch of trail, the steeper it is, the more speed it will pick up in a shorter length. Um, but when we talk about grades or the overall slope that trails are on, we talk about rise over run. Um, and we talk about it in terms of percentage. So Say the run here is 428 feet and the rise is 30 feet. So that's a 7% grade, meaning for, for the distance of run that it has, the rise is, is 30 feet. Now, it's, this is a little, it's weird because this is actually not the, you're actually measuring the hypotenuse here, so it's a little bit wonky, but don't get too hung up on that. The, the difference is that usually not that great. Um, so we talk about this in terms of percentage rather than degrees. 
Uh, if you were to convert this to, de uh, to degrees, it would be somewhere around the, the realm of, uh, God, I don't even know. Um, degrees are much more difficult to deal with, typically. Percentage is a lot more accessible. Um, so we talk about percentages and where we often want our trail steepness in terms of percentage, we, we try to keep it to about 10% if we can, um, but it's dependent on a number of factors. What kind of user group we're doing. If we're using, uh, if we're building something for, that's gonna include horses, we wanna definitely keep it to 10% or below, uh, except for maybe very short sections. Um, here in our area, because of the glacial till, we have pretty rocky and durable soils, uh, meaning in some areas we can actually get up to around 15%. Um, and we can also cheat and use other tricks occasionally. Um, if use short sections that are steeper than that and install stairs if we need to, and then keep the rest of it on a more, uh, a more gentle slope. And so punctuate areas that that abide by that 15 percent or less rule with stretches where we've gone a little bit steeper in order to gain altitude but harden it with structures like stone. Um, in addition to maximum sustainable grade there's also a term uh, of what we call the half rule and that means for whatever the, this prevailing slope is however steep the slope that a trail traverses is we don't want the trail to go any more than half that steepness for any, any reasonable length of time. So here on the left, if that's a 10% slope, or if this is a 30% slope, this 10% uh, trail is totally fine. This is a 14% slope, we're at 7%, that's fine. Um, so that said, On this 14% slope, even if we're normally able to go up to 12% for, you know, say a mountain bike trail, because this is so shallow and it's not very steep, we want to keep that down to 7% or less um, because of this situation. And the reason is, is because you're getting too close to the angle of the fall line. So if you see this, this little rainbow spectrum here, looking at the angle of the trail, the way it approaches the slope, here in the green zone, you're going directly perpendicular to the, to this, uh, the slope angle. And the closer up you get towards that prevailing slope angle, the harder it's going to be to get water off once it gets on. Um, because it's, you're getting very close to the same angle that water would want to flow to get to from the top to the bottom quickly. Uh, and this is, this graph here, this is based on actual research data uh, by Dr. Jeffrey Marion from Virginia Tech, uh, a government scientist. And he studied this, this confluence of angles. And you can see right here at this, after this 15% line in the middle, you get a big inflection uh, of soil loss. So this is not just an arbitrary number. This is actually based on measurable quantitative science. All right, so quiz, let's see, does this actually come up here? All right, so, If the fall line of this slope is 42%, what should the grade of the trail be? I guess my chance to take a sip of water. All right. OK. 
aka. All right, so uh, only about half of you fell for the trick question, uh, which is to say that you would think based on the half rule that a 42% slope, you could go up to 20% or 21, uh, but because our normal maximum sustainable grade uh, is no more than 15%, that is actually where we should stop. Um, there are some exceptions. Uh, if you're if it's for a very short stretch maybe 30 feet or less you could go that that steep or if you're going to uh harden it with stone of uh or or some other structure of one kind or another but this is assuming we're not doing that so all right moving along Uh, so in terms of constructing and, and maintaining trail, one of the other things we try to do is maintain an outslope. <clears throat> uh, some of you may already be familiar with this, uh, and that's just, just providing a, a gentle gradient from the inside of the trail edge to the outside that promotes what we call sheet flow of water, as opposed to allowing it to turn onto the trail and head along it. So the more of this water we can shed to the outside, allowing it to sheet down and across without ever running down the trail itself, uh, we try to do that. But inevitably, and this is a maintenance thing, um, you get compaction in the center, you get the back slope of the trail, uh, material sloughing off due to freeze and thaw, uh, frost heaves, um, you get a berm that builds up on the outside, and that will block water from sheeting across that same way. So we can try to <clears throat> try to deberm uh, the outside of these trail, you know, the lip of this trail. Uh, but oftentimes there's not enough people and not enough time to do that with any regularity. So um, instead, we try to design crests and dips, as I alluded to earlier, in order to break up that tread watershed that I was talking about and make it so that water can only run down the trail for a very limited space, you know, ideally no more than about 15 or 20 feet. Um, but that's not the only way. Uh, so as I mentioned, in some places, you really can't move the trail. Uh, maybe there's too many sensitive uh, habitats around, or maybe it's just not technically feasible to put it anywhere else. Um, in those cases, you can improve sustainability by picking a route and hardening it um, so that maybe people don't go around all over the place and you wind up with a 35 foot wide um, scar on the hillside, which uh, often takes place. In some other cases, you may look at, <clears throat> you know, uh, from a management perspective, limiting use type. Um, maybe you, it's, you know, can't really do much about moving the trail, but uh, you can decide that maybe this isn't something you want horses or pack stock on uh, because they just the, the soil is, is too fragile. Um, all right. Um, how are we doing on time? 618? Wow, we're, uh, we're blowing through this relatively quickly. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? All right. You guys good to keep going or should we take a break for a minute? Okay. All right, so now into the actual nitty gritty. Um, so once we've, using those design principles, um, combine that with the planning that's already been done in terms of what the control points are, then we can start the actual layout process. And the layout happens in the field, um, and it includes those smaller micro features that maybe you might not even find until the layout process. Um, and a thing to remember is this is iterative. Uh, you may go through and lay out pin flags or uh, lay out um, flagging tape for a route and then tromp around and then change it three times, five times. You may explore various options for a route before settling on one that works the best, or maybe uh, the land manager or the, what we call the ologists, the biologists, the archeologists come out and 
find a problem and then you have to make adjustments. So uh, it's rare you, you do this as a one and done uh, process. So um, some of the tools, of course, that you need for the layout process, ideally, well, you do need some um, flagging tape of some kind, uh, preferably in a bright color. Uh, orange and pink are the most common. Um, I try to use pink when I can because it stands out even in the fall. Uh, pink with stripes if I'm not needing to write on it. Some people like to to write notes on their on their flagging tape. Um, if you want to spend the money, you can get a Cento clinometer, which uses a weighted bubble, uh, <clears throat> weighted disc inside. You look through it, and it tells you what the incline of the spot you're looking at is as you go up and down. Um, this is something we would go over in the field uh, component how to use. However, um, there are a couple of pretty decent clinometer uh, apps that you can put on a smartphone, and if you can overlay them on top of the, the camera view, you can actually do a pretty good job just with a smartphone and save yourself uh, 150 bucks that way. Um, also good to have a map of some kind so you can know where you are, how close you're getting, or a GPS. Um, the level and measuring tape uh, is a little bit more uh, it's more specific for when you're having to design in stairs or something like that. Uh, one of the biggest things is, is make sure you let whoever the land manager is know before you're going to go in and, and lay out a bunch of flagging tape on the property because people can get confused and wonder what's going on, wonder if that's some sort of like hunting trail or maybe it's utility folks doing surveying work. Um, having somebody knowing what you're doing is, is useful. Uh, best layout design season is, um, I think, like late fall, usually, because um, you can still, it's still reasonably uh, amenable out weather-wise, but the leaves are off the trees, um, but recently, so you can tell uh, what's underneath, but you have better sight lines. Um, so you can see a, a greater distance for, for uh, what's coming up, and there's no bugs. So uh, it is much better to go when it's cold than when it's hot. Uh, understory vegetation can, can change how well you can see and uh, also how well you can move. Um, scouting for uh, trail uh, realignment in a thicket of multiflora rows is not my favorite. It's one of the times where I get to say, well, at least I'm getting paid. Uh, so not everyone can say that. So it makes it better. Um, Precipitation is a big one. How wet or dry has it been? You may cross a drainage when it hasn't rained in three weeks in the middle of summer or maybe uh, towards the end of fall if, if it's been light and it could be bone dry. Uh, if you can read the tea leaves on the ground and be able to tell when something is a drainage that, that, that seasonally runs or runs uh, um, periodically, that's great. Not everyone can do that. So the best time to go out is just after there's been a, a decent period of rain. So you want to see areas in high flow so that you can know the areas to avoid. Or if you're going to have some sort of stream crossing, you get a better sense of how wide does the span have to be. Uh, and then keep an eye on property boundaries. Uh, you don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers. So again, talking about clinometers, uh, they measure incline relative to what are horizontal distance you are aiming them towards. Um, and this this on the right is, uh, let me get on these. So like I said, $160 for the official uh, surveyor grade Sunto brand or Brunton, uh, or a $3 add-on to the Clinometer smartphone app. And up there in the right -hand cor upper right-hand corner, that's the icon. If you look at it in the Google Play Store for your Android, I think it's on the Apple, uh, Apple Store as well. 
um, again, these will always include percentage or degrees, and we prefer percentage of rise over run. Um, one of the best ways to do this is with a partner of relatively similar height, where you can know on a flat surface, you measure zero in front of them, and you know that zero, maybe on them, is their mouth if they're a little taller than you. Or if they're shorter than you, it might be the logo on their hat. And that way, when that person stands in 20 feet away, 30 feet away, you can measure that and where that logo on their hat is, you can then see whatever number is next to that, that's your, that's your grade. Uh, a trick that, that we use sometimes if we're out by ourselves, which is pretty frequently, is when we place our flagging tape, we place it at eye height. So that then if you then walk forward uh, 20 or 30 feet, all you have to do is turn around and then take a measurement at that flag and you know that it's at your height. Uh, makes it a little harder to check someone else's work though, because Eric is taller than me. <laughs> so when you're measuring, keep your maximum sustainable grade in mind. Uh, if you say, oh, I want to take the trail up there, you know, above that boulder, um, if, if it comes out to 17%, maybe you need to change your approach or maybe you can't go above that boulder and you have to think about other ways to make that work. Um, keep an eye on the prevailing slope. Uh, and rem you know, remember that half rule. If you're, it, it's pretty easy when you're on a steep slope, but once you get down into flatter, gently rolling terrain, it becomes very difficult to, to lay out a sustainable trail. Um, laying out trail on just very gently rolling terrain is very challenging. It's surprisingly challenging. You'd think it would be simple, but if you're going to abide by these principles, it's very difficult. Um, again, you're going to need to go back and adjust your route several times, especially if you suddenly say, oh, I really wish I could put the trail through uh, you know, between those two big trees, or, oh, the the biologist decided that this was a porcupine den and we want to avoid it, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, you have to gain some resilience in order to go through this process. So again, choose a color that you recognize. Flag sparsely at first, only as, as uh, frequently as you need to be able to see them when the leaves are out. So you may do your scouting in the fall when the leaves are down, but you may have to go back to look at it again in spring or summer. Uh, so, you know, don't put them so far apart that you can just barely see it because you may go back there when things are greened out and not be able to tell where you put your flags. However, on the other hand, um, don't place them every, you know, eight to 10 feet at first because when something changes and you have to scrap that alignment and put it somewhere else, that can be uh, a real chore, having to remove that many. Um, so make it real vague and flex sparsely until you are more certain of various portions of your alignment and then you can start to flesh them out with additional flags. Um, Again, place at eye level um, of whoever is measuring with a clinometer. Uh, in terms of tying, I try to loop and cinch around branches and saplings rather than tie in knots because that makes it easier to remove and reuse flagging. No reason to throw it out. Um, <clears throat> if you do have to tie around a large tree and tie a knot, uh, the trick we use is to orient the knot uh, on the whatever side of the tree we intend the trail to go by. So that way we know, oh, we're going uphill of this tree or downhill of this tree. Uh, and clean up as you go, as you make changes, because it can become very confusing if you have remnants of different uh, attempts and options uphill, downhill of where you are. Um, and eventually, once you get to the pre-construction phase, uh, you're going to want to um, fill in or, or replace those uh, 
flagging tape marks with pin flags uh, to mark exactly where you want the tread to be for construction. So you may need to make changes because you are trying to get to one of those positive control points and you over or undershoot it. Uh, you climb too fast or you, you didn't climb fast enough. Uh, you may run into an unexpected obstacle. Suddenly um, you wind up uh, right on top of an area that's full of bedrock and you know you're not going to be able to build there. Uh, or maybe you notice a, what's a, a beautiful uh, glacial erratic that you want to take the trail past and you need to make it climb a little faster. So then you just backtrack maybe 200 feet and make the necessary changes so that you can do that. Uh, and then the ologists may make you move the trail for one reason or another, hopefully less rather than more, but it's pretty common. All right, any questions so far? Quiet bunch, all right. All right, people management. Um, again, keep the users on, water off. This is the more touchy-feely aspect of things. Um, anticipating what people's motivators and needs are and designing and laying the trail out to try and anticipate and meet those. Um, so one of the big ones is safety. Uh, there are you know, th things on the outside edge of a steep trail. Doesn't always have to be a fence sometimes just these little stones here um, on the edge of this path on the left we call those coping stones that's just a that's kind of a construction element um, but a feeling of safety will keep someone on the trail if they feel as though they're not uh, they're not truly in control of their own safety they're going to take measures uh, into their own hands they may leave the trail they may damage vegetation um, any number of things because they're gonna try and meet that need themselves. Uh, efficiency, big with hikers, less big with mountain bikers. So uh, the trail itself may take this yellow path on the right, but if a user sees that and feels that it doesn't get them to where they wanna go efficiently enough, they're going to make their own way if it's easy enough for them to do so. So they may go around that boulder instead of up and over it because that seems to be too much work. Uh, you need to be able to read, especially in assessment, if that's what's happening. Um, it's like, okay, it's not efficient enough for them. Um, but you need to get a feeling for how much meandering up and down will people, will people swallow before they say nuts to this and go their own way. Uh, and it is, it's very subjective. And it does depend on what kind of users you've got. How, uh, you know, is it someone who, people who have gone through more leave no trace indoctrination um, than you can imagine? Or are these the, what I call the white sneaker set who are coming out for their first time for a hike and they know nothing about that and they're just going to go wherever they want. Um, so, and we, we're getting into real new agey territory here with uh, things we call harmonies is how, how well does a trail or a stretch of trail blend in with its surroundings? Uh, so what's one of the reasons we like to build with stone so much is because it naturally blends in and has a sense of harmony. Um, in this staircase on the left, the whole idea of wrapping around this boulder on the right, which is an anchor, uh, we'll get into anchors in a second, it, it responds and flows around the natural features. We're trying to approximate and, and replicate how maybe this would occur if people were walking it in naturally, rather than simply you know, cutting a straight line. Uh, straight lines by, by their nature are not terribly harmonious in a natural setting. So we like to have a lot more uh, wrapping around features and curves uh, and meandering. So even on this, on the right-hand side, this boardwalk, it could be straight as an arrow. And Lord knows it's easier to build straight as an arrow with dimensional lumber, but they designed this to have 
some wiggle and go between trees and respond to the trees that are kind of on the right hand side instead of plowing through them. Um, are people looking for a challenge or do they want to, you know, um, if you've been out on crew work, uh, I'm sure you've all heard the jokes from hikers about escalators. It's like, oh, you build me an escalator? Um, and, you know, some people might think that they want that, but uh, is, it, is it appropriate for who you're building for? Um, is this climbing quickly enough? If you've got a trail that you're putting in, you may have it abide by all the sustainability principles and the half rule and all that. But if people want to get from A to B very quickly and you take them on a series of switchbacks over and over again, they're not going to like that very much. So sometimes you need to factor in that need for challenge, efficiency, anything like that in order if the end result is going to be whether or not they stay on the trail. Um, destinations. So that's, you know, people, sometimes they want to get to something. Oftentimes they want to get to something. That thing could be a view. It could be a water feature or, or a waterfall. Um, it could be a, a destination to another trail, perhaps. Uh, in other cases, especially for uh, users with a different mode of experience, like mountain bikers, the trip around the loop the, the, the actual trail ride is the experience. Um, so you want to factor in those desires um, and take them into account when, how many, how many little micro features are you gonna uh, try and route them towards versus if they want to just want to get up to this cliff, you want to get them up to that cliff quickly because they're not there for a hike, they're there for a view. Um, so in terms of the nuts and bolts features we think about um, when we're actually laying out a stretch of trail. So anchors are, are any prominent feature either on the landscape as a whole or just within whatever is visible around you. And that can be an individual boulder that you can wrap around. It can be an individual large tree, even I think that's a tulip poplar. Um, and gateways are nothing more than two prominent anchors that the trail goes through. And there is something very satisfying about going through a gateway because there's a sense of a reveal. Um, there's usually a small, it's a minor change of experience when you're going through the gateway and oftentimes there's something different on the other side, uh, which can be very um, satisfying and dramatic. Uh, so as much as possible, uh, I try to incorporate gateways into the layout. Um, edges can be interesting too. So rather than, in this case, rather than going straight through this, uh, this marsh, you can go from one end to the other directly across in an arbitrary way. This instead skirts the edge of this, uh, of this tree line. So to your left, you get one uh, natural setting and habitat in the marsh. And on the right, you've got uh, scrub forest. So riding that edge of contrast uh, is satisfying. Um, again, e even with something as simple as this, having a little bit of, of wiggle and flow, this is a little bit janky uh, for my taste in terms of, it's, it's a little too wiggly personally, but um, you don't want to necessarily have something that's straight as an arrow if you can help it. Uh, if for no other reason then straight as an arrow tends to lend itself to poor drainage um, because you want to break it up into small micro opportunities to drain water off of your trail. All right, so um, just sort of general do's and don'ts. Incorporate natural features uh, as anchors, gateways, and edges. Um, they're natural opportunities to um, incorporate the surrounding environment into the physical experience that people will have when they when they traverse what you've laid out for them. Uh, plan in those undulations and meanders for drainage and a feeling of, of uh, natural belonging and harmony on the trail. Um, rocks aren't just aesthetic features, they're also 
tread reinforcement. They can, you know, uh, hold up a hillside. So using those rocks as anchors to one side or another of a trail are extremely useful. Uh, and in many cases, they're building materials. Um, things to avoid are going down slope of large trees, uh, immediately down slope at least, because usually you wind up getting into uh, trouble with roots. Um, and that's bad for the tree, and it's also bad for the trail worker who has to cut all those roots. Um, so instead, we try to go up and above on the back of what we call the shoulder of the tree and uh, travel that way. Um, don't lay anything out that users would find inefficient based on their, uh, based on their demographic group, their user group, because that will lead to shortcutting and braiding, um, and then you've got a maintenance problem. Uh, keep an eye out for areas that could have bedrock or thin soils underneath because um, can't very well uh, bench cut a trail into bedrock um, and then you get into things like retaining wall and things like that. Um, a small thing is uh, try, if, try to keep your trail from riding right along the ridge line if you can uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, sound tends to travel a little bit better uh, along ridge tops, and so you could be disturbing other uh, other users. Um, and also, wildlife corridors tend to uh, tend to like to use ridge tops for travel, uh, and putting your trail there could disrupt them. Uh, okay. So, if for those of you who have not seen it before or not familiar, um, this is bench cut construction on a side hill. Uh, the main part is essentially to cut a wedge, excavate a wedge from the hillside in order to produce a flat tread. If you're going across a slope, you're going to need to flatten it. Uh, and we do that by removing the, uh, the ground cover and, you know, and vegetation and then removing the organic layer uh, and getting it down to mineral soil, which is the you know, nice peanut butter colored usually, or reddish uh, soil that's underneath. It's less water absorbent, it's more durable. And we sculpt that into a nearly flat tread, um, but then incorporating outslope. Uh, kind of a different topic, but if, if you think about uh, knowing how this looks when it's done and what's what goes into actually doing it helps inform uh, your considerations when you're actually laying out those pin flags and visualizing what it's going to look like at the end. All right, so we've gone through concept, planning, and layout. And then we've got these last three, review, construction, maintenance, monitoring, assessment, which those are a little bit separate and probably uh, worth their own video. Um, and I think maintenance, monitoring, and assessment, you probably don't need as much information from me on that. Does anyone have any questions? Really? Okay. Well, uh, we wound up blowing through this nice and quick. So uh, if anyone does have any questions, um, my email address is bsugar at nynjtc dot org and I will be again uh, mailing out a list of reference materials that uh, contain some more of this so that you can if you like uh, learn about this from someone other than me and uh, if you're involved in trail building uh, of any kind and you have questions or, or want some input uh, feel free to reach out and let me know what you think. Um, and again, this will be hosted online. What is your availability for consultation on new trails? Uh, it is seasonally dependent. Um, fall and winter are the best times. Uh, we, uh, I, either Tracy or myself or both uh, could come out and, and consult. Um, generally, November through, uh, I'd say April, are the best times for a number of reasons, partly because during 
the warm months, we are out with the crews and not doing a lot of scouting generally. Um, and we have a certain amount of bandwidth built in to be able to do those things. So um, ideally, if you get something on our radar uh, with some advance notice, it's a little bit easier to uh, work that in over the course of the, the coming months. Uh, because we, you know, we wind up juggling that in uh, in addition to other things. Okay, are there any guidelines when planning trail reroutes or converting informal trails? Uh, yes, interesting you mentioned that. Um, DEC has their own guidelines. Um, OPRHP state parks have their own guidelines. Um, in fact, I can link to the document when I send out a follow-up email. It is, uh, it's a compilation guidebook from the trail conference on uh, the, the approval process for um, proposing new or rerouted trails uh, and what is required. Um, basically, you need to put in a, a proposal and a, and a, a work plan and then it gets reviewed by whoever the land manager is locally, as well as uh, you know the regional office and that sort of thing. And then they go out and will walk it with you. Uh, but it, it does depend upon the jurisdiction um, and whether or not that something is already in a planning document. That's a nice thing when someone does a trails master plan. Um, if it's at all in congruence with that, it's a lot easier to get approval. If you are proposing something out of the wild blue yonder, um, they're gonna make you jump through some more hoops. I've worked with Chris Connolly five years. I love Chris. Uh, okay. All right. All right, everyone. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll hear from me uh, by email soon and um, feel free to respond with, with any other questions you think of uh, afterwards. And um, have a good night. Take it easy.